Uh, I get it. Everybody knows about the ultimatum. Yes, I told everyone. <laughs> hey, right back at you, bitch. Welcome back, fans and friends, to the Complete Guide to Horror podcast. Today, we're discussing the 2016 horror movie, The Belko Experiment, which is also Coop's Pick of the Month. And now, this movie was directed by Greg McLean, who also directed Wolf Creek alongside Vogue. So, you know, very famous Australian director, if you like. Uh, This movie was also written by James Gunn, who, fun fact, also wrote the first two Scooby-Doo movies. Uh, he's also done like Guardians of the Galaxy, a bunch of like superhero stuff I really don't give a fuck for. And then I secretly drop handfuls of it on the floor as the movie plays. I don't understand why. To make the fatties feel bad about themselves. Then they feel terrible and eat more. It's like my favorite hobby. The Belco experiment follows 80 Americans working abroad for a company named Belco Industries in Colombia. One day after they arrive at work, they are locked inside the building where a mysterious voice announces that they have to start killing each other or else. And no, the voice is not John Kramer and is definitely not the piece of shit voice from Spiral. So, you know, this is actually a good movie. I was expecting it to go in different directions, even just like small little things. I know that this was a 2016 film, so I was like, oh, I bet they're going to do something where they purposely keep the gay character alive until the end. No, they do not. Plot twist. And, you know, we are recording this episode during Mardi Gras World Pride Week, so immediately Greg McLean is homophobic. No. Are you homosexual? Huh? Are you homosexual? No. Okay. <laughs> Just kidding. But aside from that, I actually thought this was quite a unique approach. I mean, I've seen similar like workplace horror movies or there might be a horror movie where scenes are featured in an office or featured in some type of different environment aside from like your standard haunted house or cornfield or you know paranormal activity for instance but I really like this movie I think this is a very solid pick coup and you know I will say my favorite parts and least favorite parts uh but I do want to stress this is actually a Blumhouse production so uh you know, not your regular Blumhouse production per se. This is part of Blumhouse Tilt. They also did the very underrated Unfriended Dark Web. And they've done some other horror movies that generally get better critical and audience reception compared to, say, I guess the whole just shitty river stream of crap that Blumhouse has done in recent years. That's all I'm going to say about that one. But, uh, Coop, what are your overall thoughts on the Belco experiment and why did you pick it for your pick of the month? um this is definitely up there for me i think it's definitely one of my favorite more recent movies i mean it came out what like five six years ago now but like in my head that's recent um uh, movies that i've enjoyed um i think it's just such a good mix of um it's i mean it's mainly just horrific but there's just these really well done notes of comedy throughout this movie that are done really really well i feel like the cast is really strong and even the small little characters that just have a couple of words just really pop throughout the movie um and it's just a fascinating premise for for a movie um anyone that's kind of worked in an office before it's just like oh fuck what would um in a life or death situation like how quickly would my co-workers turn on me you know what i mean like it's that scary strike scream and run all right let's try it complete chaos but um yeah hell of a movie i think yeah this was something that actually kept me uh quite alert it's rare for any movie not just horror but i mean we were talking about in previous episodes about how it's almost a struggle to watch an entire movie now 
and this movie I didn't look at my phone once. Um, I didn't feel the need to because it seemed like this was quite uh, fast paced but in a good way. So it was like, oh, a little bit of action, bam, some new twist happens, you see more people die, then bam, there's another twist or there's another action set piece. Um, I also felt this was quite scary. They really captured that atmosphere of, what the fuck, we have to kill our co-workers or I might be killed, what's going on? Like, I really felt that fear throughout this movie. Uh, just a little side note. <laughs> so if I was ever in a situation like this where people were told they had to kill people or whatnot, I know straight away I'd be the first to die because like, I'm generally regarded as like more of the, my God. Don't get me wrong, very professional at my job, but I'm one of the most annoying people to work with because I do not shut the fuck up. Like, I'll randomly go over to entirely separate team's desk and be like, hey, babe, what's going on? Let's talk about this. Or tell me about how your date went last night and just like, <laughs> never shut up. So I know straight away they'd be like, we can kill him and we won't be charged. So, you know, shout out to my former co workers. Uh, <laughs> BP, what are your overall thoughts on Velcro? Yeah, initially, I'd never heard of it. Um, I, like reading the plot, I reminded me of a movie called The Circle, kind of a similar oh, setting. Yeah. No one's ever watched yeah. that. Exactly. And I was like, is this just another version, but in an office? And um, for some reason, in the poster and initial uh, view of this movie, I just thought it was like a VOD release and sort of just like one that wasn't that good. But I came away actually, like I was surprised actually it was decent viewing. Um, yeah, I think the casting was really great. There were some really good scenes of um, just pretty much like helplessness and fear and this sort of thing of who you kill, like 30 of you got to go initially or whatever. And, um, yeah, I had a good time. It was a lot better than what I thought. Um, uh, the posters, I don't really like the poster. I think the poster is a bit deceiving. It just looks like someone with a squeegee and <laughs> on his head or something. Um, so it's kind of a little bit different. Like the poster is different to, I guess, what the movie was. But no, I had a good time um, with this one. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, great point about the poster too. I would have liked to have seen something where, and I'm sure there's maybe alternate posters out mm -hmm. there on the internet and whatnot, but for the main one, even if it's just like a shot of, all the co-workers, yeah. maybe it's something simple where they all look like they're busy at work, like at the photocopier or at a computer or just talking to colleagues. And then there's just like someone with their brain blown out or something. That would draw me in to be like, well, what the fuck is that about? What, what does that mean? Or maybe it's like a shot from the movie where they're like being executed one by one or something. Or there's probably like, what's the word, uh, issues around getting marketing approved. Like uh, we spoke in one of our very first episodes actually on captivity where there was a huge um, controversy with the marketing of that movie where as a result, the MPAA, which is like the ratings board in America, refused to rate the movie. So it significantly hindered its chances on box office success. The movie rarely got screened. So I guess it's hard for the marketing team to do that with a concept like this. <laughs> Hey, I know what'll impress everybody. I'll start a fire. I think this movie was shot really, really well. I really liked the cinematography. It really captured that essence of, you know, this is supposed to be a professional workplace, but even just like the contrasting colors, like the whites with the blacks versus the really bright red hues of the blood, it just really helps set it apart. I really liked everything to do with the details i like that the characters actually thought more logically compared to other horror movies um even where there's that one character that tries to hide in the elevator and you think what are you doing get out like you're gonna mm. get crushed if the elevator starts moving and well plot twist that's what happens mm. but likewise i think that whole conundrum around well if we don't kill people we're all going to be killed until there's one left so what the hell do we do? And, you know, try to see that dialogue between them. Uh, I kind of wish they would bring up, maybe the filmmakers felt it was a bit too controversial, but I think it would have been such a fitting purpose if they had more discussions being like, you can't kill me, I'm the only black guy here, or I'm the only gay guy here, or mm. I, I'm the only woman or pregnant or 
you know, something like that. Like, uh, they did that in Source 6 where she's like, don't kill me, I'm pregnant. Yeah. He's <laughs> like, like, you're not pregnant, bitch. <laughs> yeah, like, I would have liked some banter like that because yeah. I could see that coming into play. I mean, if it happened to me, I'd definitely use the gay card and be like, mm. you kill me, you're homophobic. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know, but maybe that all would have also, like, removed the tone from the movie. So, you know, I'll give the filmmakers credit for it. The stress of my mind! Depression. Depression? Isn't that just a fancy word for feeling bummed out? Dwight, you ignorant slut. I like the, the opening scene with the um, Spanish version of um, I Will Survive. Um, and then again later in the movie, I think it's when all the employees are getting killed. They have the Spanish version of uh, California Dreaming. I sing a line, you repeat it. It's quite easy. No, it's all oh, the leaves are brown, all oh, the leaves are brown, and the sky is gray, and the sky is gray. I've been for a walk, I've been for a walk on a winter's day, on a winter's day. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the leaves are brown, the leaves are brown, and the sky is gray, and the sky is gray. John Gallagher Jr. Like when I first saw that, I was like, "Oh, is that?" Um, uh, there's this band I follow called Dying Fetus. They're amazing. Um, and I was like, "Oh, I wonder if that's the, if that's his son." But it's no relation to him at all. Not his son. Just so everyone's aware. <laughs> um, I think my favorite scene. There's, I mean, there's re- a lot of really good shots in the movie. Um, I really like the scene in the uh, lobby when the uh, that Barry Norris, he's about to start killing everyone, but he's just standing over the like the console area and just the angle you can only see him, and then it pans up and then you see all the employees standing around freaking out. Mm. Um, I also really like the part where that um, the stoner employee, after he's gone around um, pouring out all the water because he's like, oh, you know, it's it's a chemical in our brain mm. or whatever. Um, and he's just in the kitchen area or like the, the um, mess hall area. Uh, and he's just like, it's all in my head. It's all in my head. And there's just like under the table, all the people's heads are popping and going, but it's just a fucking hectic mm. um, shot, that one. Um, so yeah, lots of really strong scenes um, throughout um, and all really kind of hit really hard as well. I like the, that funny part with the character Danny um where it comes down to uh tally where it's like whoever get, gets the most kills escapes mm. um and uh roberto's in the lift and he's got an arm around her and it's just like uh, uh danny uh one kill and then he just like takes his arm off her because she's already killed someone um <laughs> uh, but yeah the, those little bits of, of comedy throughout the the uh, movie was really good as well like that guy from um silicone valley uh, when he's uh, he thinks it's over and then he just gets his brain popped anyway it's a real comical death that one but mm. yeah <laughs> lots of strong things in this movie I think yeah Kelly's training us this day is bananas B-A-N-A-N-A-S this day is bananas B-A-N-A I don't have a headache I'm just preparing the one thing I, I noticed with this movie, uh, it's one that I always use, like, would you rather is a good example. And so it's a, it's when it's sort of like just one location that the movie's sort of filmed in. So like, would you rather is set like pretty much just in the premise of being in a, a, a room in a house, but they don't really make good use of that time. So I think this movie does a really good job of actually making good use of being in an office and showing like alternative scenes, like the elevator scene, sort of like the... Um, downstairs scene and that sort of stuff so i think it's not just samey samey for 90 minutes or so it's kind of does actually move around well i manage my department and i've been doing that for several years now and god i've learned a lot of life lessons along the way your department's just you right yes jim but i am not easy to manage the editing i thought was really good uh there were a couple good kill scenes the one i really liked was um the one where they're downstairs and then um pushes the guy up against the wall and the nail in the back of the head. 
Mm. Mm-hmm. I like that. And then I like the Halloween kills esque scene where the guy's on the ground and everyone comes over and actually kills him rather than like savagely mm. just hits him and then Michael Myers gets up and walks away. But this one, everyone comes in. I think even the Indian lady comes over and kicks him or something. Ryan use it as an object. As an object. Ryan use me as an object. My favorite scene. I think it's in that scene you're talking about, Coop, where the heads are exploding. It's somewhere around there. And it's kind of like a Rocky Balboa scene where he does like a fist pump in the air and it's a back shot of him out and it's like a white background and you sort of see it reminds me a bit like a Breakfast Club ending sort of thing. I thought that was a really good shot. Um, and the scene where they're all sort of on their knees and they're shooting them one by one, it was kind of um, like it doesn't hit home. It just reminds me of like going on... Um, so like best score website back in the day mm. and you Ooh, like yeah. would click on like a the heading or like a, a suicide thing and you're like oh, i don't want to see that but that's what it kind of went straight back to is that sort of um thing i have a big issue with the ending and it's not necessarily because i do think it ties in well with this movie as a concept but I've seen the same ending in at least 20 other horror movies. I mean, the earliest one I can think of is a very unknown 2005 horror called House of Nine, where that movie, she yeah. actually very similar concept. So in House of Nine, nine people are pitted together. Whoever survives gets to leave the house with $5 million from memory. But there's like 85 alternate endings to that movie. But the main one that was released on DVD and the theatrical release shows that when she leaves the house, she actually ends up in another house where there's other survivors from previous other House of Nines. So it's like, oh, this is going to be like the Hunger Games, uh, what's it called, Quarter Quell version or Drag Race All-Stars version. Yeah. And this part, I was like, oh, okay. They ended the first sequence. Now they're commencing the next stage. Okay. Was it supposed to be to set up for a sequel that never got made or was that just it? I would have preferred something where, actually, no, that's a lie. I don't know what I would have preferred. I was going to say maybe he thinks he's won and then when he enters that other room at the end of the movie, maybe they kill him, but that would have been like, oh, that was shit. Like, why waste my time? Or, you know, very reminiscent of uh, Cube Zero, part of that Cube film series. Mm. Um, I don't know what they should have ended it with. I just wish it wasn't this. I don't talk trash, I talk smack. They're totally different. Trash talk is all hypothetical, like, your mom is so fat she could eat the internet. But smack talk is happening like right now. Like, you're ugly and I know it for a fact, cause I get the evidence right there. There's a part earlier in the movie where the security guard is he's fiddling around with the radio and he's trying to like find anything and he can't. But then when they're about to kill everyone, he says, put on some music and he turns on the radio and they get a station and they're listening to music. So that pissed me off. Um, I agree with you about the ending. It's it's pretty ho-hum. I've seen it before as well. It reminds me of the ending of a movie called Condemned um, that had uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin in it um, <laughs> and that uh, British actor that's always a bad guy. Um, I think it was actually a WWE movie, um, but it's kind of, kind of similar, except they're on an island, they're wearing ex- explosives and they've got to kill each other. Um, but towards the end, they end up in the room where they're watching and the people that are watching get killed and it's just very that. Um, but uh, I agree with you. I don't know how, like, what's another way that it could have ended. I, I haven't even had a look. Maybe there are other endings out there. I haven't seen any. Um, but... Uh, yeah, the ending isn't that great. They, I guess they didn't really leave themselves anywhere to go in the end, which is unfortunate. If I had created a website with this many problems, I'd kill myself. Do you have a question, Kelly? Yeah, I have a lot of questions. Number one, how dare you? I didn't really, like, the ending was fine. I think if they just left it maybe and not doing the whole, like, 50,000 different places to doing the same thing, it would have been fine. It just left it as just, it was its own thing. Uh, um, in saying that as well, I kind of wish maybe they would show scenes of the ending, but maybe throughout the movie, even at the start. I don't know if there's any any shots of the guy speaking into the, I, I think there's shots of like the screens and stuff like that, but there's no real sort of going back to who's like actually doing it. It's sort of only really revealed at the end, which I kind of get why they did that, but it might've been nice to 
when they first announced that you just got like a shot of someone's mouth talking into a microphone so you're trying to like be like who's this person because mm. um, it just felt a bit weird that they were kind of just taking orders from a speaker which i guess after the 30 people died initially they were like oh shit, this is real but i just thought it was a bit bizarre that you're listening to a speaker and going like oh we should do something i never really thought about death until princess diana died that was the saddest funeral ever that and my sisters i think it's fine i don't think it needs a sequel i don't think they needed to do um what they did but i have a feeling like every filmmaker these days seems to do it to sort of leave that door open for yeah a possibility to come back but i don't really feel like the ratio of them doing a sequel ever really happens with these movies that is a great idea ultimatums are key basically nobody does anything for me anymore unless i threaten to kill myself there's little bits of trivia about this movie more so around james gunn so he actually wrote the first draft of the script in two weeks he also got the idea for the story from a dream he had this is quite a recurring theme I've noticed, like Sinister. The writer also got the idea from Sinister by having this nightmare after watching The Ring when he had a, what was it? Uh, he watched The Ring and then he had a nightmare that he was watching a home movie of people getting hung. So that's like the opening sequence of Sinister. Um, likewise, James Gunn was originally set to direct this film from his screenplay, but when it was time to begin, he withdrew as A, he was going through a divorce at the time, B, he didn't want to spend several months working on such a violent movie. Maybe he has violent tendencies, I don't know. And he withdrew from the project, but he was so happy that Greg McLean jumped on board as director so that, you know, he could bring his script to life, which I think there needs to be more of. I see a lot of writer-directors and often the execution is nowhere near as good as the script, so... Maybe they do need to tag team, just have a different director, different writer to really bring out the best in both. You guys, I'm like really smart now. You don't even know. You could ask me, Kelly, what's the biggest company in the world? And I'd be like, blah, 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 giving you the exact right answer. A little bit of Wolf Creek trivia. So John Jarrett, who played, you know, the villain in Wolf Creek 1 and 2 in the TV series, he was originally offered a role in Belco, but he had to turn it down due to scheduling conflicts with the TV series. And, you know, I would have, I wonder what that would have been like. Maybe he would have played like the Australian. Yeah, I was going to say, it'd be so obvious. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but I do like that when directors work with the same actors across different projects. To mm. me, it's like, oh, they're like a cute little family or. Yeah, it's a nice relationship to have. Yeah. Um, now, apparently in real life, a similar experiment testing human behaviour was conducted in 1963 by psychologist Dr. Stanley Milgram. <laughs> the experiment was to focus on the conflict between obedience to authority and personal conscience. One of his concluding remarks stated, stark authority was pitted against the subject's strongest moral imperatives against hurting others, and with the subject's ears ringing with the screams of the victims, authority won more often than not. The extreme willingness of adults to go to almost any lengths on the command of an authority constitutes the chief finding of the study and the fact most urgently demanding explanation. The experiment has since been discredited as mostly false. There's been other similar experiments in the sense of like a personal conscience, uh, there's that very famous performance artist, Maria, I forget her last name. Uh, she does like strange things time to time. Like she sat at a table for like 72 weeks or something and had people come and like sit and stare at her for a minute. Then they like pass along. It was something to do around like first interactions or something. But she did this experiment where she sat naked in an art gallery and on this table was like, a flower, a gun, a knife, a feather, all these things to, so they could either like punish her or they could pleasure her. And she said that at first it was things like people just wanted to like creepily touch her hair or poke her in the arm or something. And then eventually it led to a point where someone actually sliced her neck with the knife or pointed the gun at her head. And she's like, the more that I kept doing this experiment, the more violent people became because they were trying to get a reaction out of her. 
It's just like, fuck that. It's, if I tried to do that and someone came at me with a gun, I'd be like, security? <laughs> like, <laughs> no. In terms of ratings, I'm going to give this one eight bullet wounds out of ten. Uh, for me, I do have to take away points for the ending. I also feel, even if it was like a slightly better ending or something, to me it's not really a 10 out of 10. Maybe if it was a more, I don't know, ending that I liked, I would have given it 9 out of 10. But yeah, I'll leave it at 8 bullet shots out of 10. Uh, Coop, what's your rating? Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of it. I'm going to give it um, 8.5 brain pops out of 10. Mm-hmm. Jeez, okay. Nice. And last but not least, BP, what is your rating? Um, I'm going to give it seven elevator <laughs> slams out of ten. Nice. So I think averaged out, it's about 7.5. Actually, no, I think it's 7.5 or 8 out of 10. Yeah. I think this could have taken off to be... Maybe not a big franchise per se, but at least have a string of sequels, even if it was like direct to Netflix or direct to Tubi or I, I don't know if direct to DVD even exists these days. But you know, could have I could have seen a sequel, I would have watched it as well. Um, maybe they felt they didn't have enough of a coherent storyline, otherwise, it's just a retread of the first movie. But I know I still would have liked to have seen it. Um, can't fault the script, storyline, anything like that. Actually, no, I will fault the script. Still hate the ending, but that's my own personal vendetta. Uh, Coop, do you have any final thoughts on your pick of the month? Um, I think it's worth it's a, it's worthy viewing. Um, I think it's um, it's an interesting ride. Um, I do, yeah, I do agree that I think the ending. Um, was yeah definitely kind of unnecessary but again what else are you going to do mm. um but yeah definitely worth a watch check it out nice and bp what are your final thoughts yeah i think um it, uh, it was good viewing experience um plenty of blood and gore um good action sequences um strong or strong acting nothing's really forced or fake or just cringy i think it's a sort of a good array of different actors in one room um yeah it's it's good viewing experience and um i mean the ending is the ending but like you guys have said there's not really much they could do different so yeah it's kind of very hard to sort of fault this movie but it's a good movie to watch yeah Coop and BP, just want to say thank you very much for joining me again today to discuss the Belco experiment. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, For our listeners, we have new episodes each week, so give them a look. If you like this episode, give us a like, comment, share, tip, etc, etc. Also, check out our new Letterboxd profile. I've linked it in the description of this video. And if you hated this episode... In two minutes, we want 30 of you dead. Hey, small friend, when one video ends, just have another one. It's called binge viewing. Go ahead, I support you.